This will be a lecture on Fatima Mernissi's The Veil and the Male Elite, a Feminist Interpretation of Women's Rights in Islam. Now, this lecture is primarily intended for students at Western Washington University who are uh, presumably not uh, that familiar with the uh, with uh, Islam itself as a religion, much less with women's issues within Islam. So we're going to be dealing with some pretty basic stuff for newcomers to this material. And uh, this is a text that I've used in my classes at Western Washington and other places for a number of years, uh, in part because I think it's a, a really wonderful introduction to Islam itself. It, Mernissi is, is an extremely, extraordinarily gifted writer. She's very eloquent, and uh, she just does a marvelous job of, of introducing ideas, concepts, historical figures, personages, and so on to, to people, uh, particularly in the West, who just don't know this history. And so I, I've said for years, I've told my students, um, you know, read this book if you're, as, as a beginning place for understanding Islam. So it's, it's, uh, she just does an outstanding job, not only of presenting the history, but also of herself uh, d doing the work of uh, interpretation. And so it's, it's uh, I, I emphasize this word interpretation here because it's also a, uh, a wonderful example of exegesis, uh, uh, which is to say of, of critical hermeneutic interpretation. And so if you're interested in critical theory, uh, aside from the question of Islam or women's issues in Islam, it's just a marvelous uh, text for uh, performing close readings and, and uh, learning about, uh, particularly in the Islamic tradition, how to perform close readings of the Quran and the Hadith itself. And these are issues that we'll discuss in this lecture. So I'm going to try to keep us uh, focused on the text itself and go through the main issues. There's a lot in this text. We can't possibly cover uh, all of the material that this text addresses, but we'll try to address the main themes particularly the themes dealing with uh, the questions linked or pertinent to the veil and also the question of Quranic hermeneutics itself. This is something that I want to uh, address as we go into this uh, material. And I'll define this term Quranic hermeneutics uh, momentarily. Now, uh, here you can see is an image of Fatima Mernissi. She was a Moroccan scholar. She died in 2015. That was about five years ago from the time of this lecture. The book, The Veil and the Male Elite, is my personal favorite, but she wrote many works, and they're all uh, very uh, worthy of reading. Dreams of Trespass is a memoir of her growing up in a harem in, uh, in Morocco, and it gives you a, a glimpse of what it would be like as, as a young Muslim woman growing up in Morocco. Scheherazade Goes West is uh, a, a book about her experiences coming to the West. And I, I should note that she became, as time went by, she became a little bit more, you know, reluctant to use this term feminism, which we find on the cover of the Veil and the Male Elite, I think in part because she was not as comfortable with what the term itself meant in the context of the United States and the West in general. And so when we when we think about this word about Fatima Mernissi being a, a Muslim feminist, I think we want to put that word feminism in quotes because it comes with a lot of qualifications. We want to, in any case, not just assume that it means the, the same thing that it means in the West. She was a uh, a woman, a Moroccan woman, Arab and Berber uh, descent, and um, she was a Muslim. And so uh, consequently, uh, uh, as I've said in my in a lecture on the same YouTube channel on, uh, on Maryam Abba in Senegal, we have to, uh, much like in the case of Fanon, you know, Fanon makes this point in uh, in the wretched of the earth, that if, if we're going to use, say, Marx in the African context, we have to adjust Marx to African realities. And I think the same really is true with Mernissi in feminism, that we, you know, we need to make sure that we uh, think about feminism adjusted to very specific, uh, particular 
uh, African and Islamic realities, and she's coming from within this experience. And so she's militating or advocating for women's rights, but she's she's not uh, like, uh, let's say, Maryam Abash in, in Senegal. She's not by any means departing from the religion of her childhood, the religion of Islam. Now, um, I would uh, note also this book, another book that she wrote, Islam and Democracy. Um, I, I strongly recommend this work. Uh, it's, it, you know, particularly if you're, uh, if you live in the United States and Europe or elsewhere in the West, you're trying to really understand the Islamic world and you're looking at it from the outside. It's, it's a great point of entry for thinking about questions of the democratic in relation to the Islamic world. And again, Mernissi was just, she was a very eloquent and gifted writer. And so as is true of the Veil and the Malalite also in this text, I think this is my second favorite text of hers. She, she also um, really does a great job of, of uh, dealing with concepts and explaining the Islamic world to people who are non-Muslims. But I, th but I think also I should note that many Muslims uh, in uh, North Africa, Africa, and the Middle East have found her work also to be inspirational as well. Now, um, although I should note she is a, fi a figure of controversy, some uh, find her views to be uh, too liberal in effect. But uh, here's, here's let, let's look at what she's doing here. This is in the very beginning of her text. She says, since Islam is no more repressive than Judaism or Christianity, they're all, you know, Abrahamic traditions. She's making that point. Uh, there must be those who have a vested interest in blocking women's rights in Muslim societies. Islam promised equality and dignity for all men and women. If women's rights are a problem for some modern Muslim men, it is neither because of the Quran nor the prophet nor the Islamic tradition, but simply because those rights conflict with the interests of a male elite. The elite faction is trying to convince us that their egotistic, highly subjective and mediocre view of the culture and society has a sacred basis. Now she doesn't mention here specifically uh, let's say Wahhabism from Saudi Arabia. She does in um, Islam and Democracy speak of you know Wahhabi uh, petrodollars and 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 the the problem of the you know of this money that emanates from this region and how this this view about women that also emanates from the Wahhabi world has uh, come into say places like Morocco, which are not the same. And it's important you know the the culture of the Maghreb is by no means the same as the culture of Saudi Arabia. And she's not speaking as a Saudi Arabian woman, but as a Maghribian Moroccan woman. And that certainly affects her uh, point of view. But she, you know, she notes the problem of what she's calling the male elite also in, in the Moroccan context as well. And so this is what she's going to zero in on is this question of, you know, uh, how there is a kind of an elite that, that want to keep women from the promise that was embedded in particularly in the early days of the origin of Islam in the time of the Prophet Muhammad uh, to uh, women, for women, uh, you know, what, by particularly by going back and looking at the early days of the uh, Islamic Era. So she's going to say, we Muslim can walk into the modern world with pride, knowing that the quest for dignity, democracy and human rights for full participation in the political and social affairs of our country stems from no imported Western values, but is a true part of the Muslim tradition. And this this is going to be an, a very important part of what she wants to argue here in this text is that she, she's she's combating this notion that uh, that that the that the quest the, the fight for uh, equality for women is something that is somehow imported from the West. She wants very much to show that this is something that uh, is is present in the earliest days of the Islamic tradition, and, and that the history of women and the history of Islam is far more complicated than some of the those who are controlling the narrative about the historical narrative about Islam, men particularly what she's calling the male elite, have allowed. Now in this picture here, I show you a picture from Saudi Arabia of a woman walking unveiled and women walking with veils. And this is this is the dynamic she's, that we're going to be uh, considering. And she is, uh, Mernissi is speaking on behalf of, of Muslim women, but she's she's making a case 
that is not uh, for a return to the veil, but for a more complex thinking about the question of the veil, which she sees as a fundamental concept in the history of Islam. Uh, and here's what she says. She says, to defend the violation of women's rights, it is necessary to go back into the shadows of the past. Let us leave the international scene and go into the dark back streets of Medina. This is the city of the Prophet Muhammad. Why is it that we find some Muslim men saying that women in Muslim states cannot be guaranteed full enjoyment of human rights? What grounds do they have for such a claim? None. They are simply betting on our ignorance of the past, for their argument can never convince anyone with an elementary understanding of Islam's history. And then she goes on to say that the, the very first revelation that Allah or God sent the prophet Muhammad through his angel Gabriel was the first verse of Surah 96, read. So Islam begins with an order to read, to inform oneself. And so this really is what she's doing. And again, She's doing it from within an Islamic tradition, from within the Islamic perspective, as a Muslim, as a Muslim woman, Islam instructs us from its get-go to, to read, to, to learn, to inform oneself. And she's going to do precisely that by going back and, and much, you know, like, let's say, for instance, the Wahhabi tradition in Saudi Arabia that very much seeks to return to sort of the good old days of, of, of the Prophet Muhammad. She's, she's basically saying, okay, if that's, if that's what you want to do, let's do it. Let's go back and let's see what really took place in, in the so-called good old days of, of the era of, of the Prophet Muhammad. Uh, and uh, she makes this really interesting point that this the so-called male elite is betting on our ignorance. And so if we inform ourselves, she says, then maybe we'll see we can see for ourselves that the issues are a little bit more complex than some of these uh, more simple interpretations, for instance, like the Wahhabi interpretations suggest. Now, she doesn't use that word in this text. I should qualify that. I'm I'm adding that as my own uh, interpretation here. Uh, but 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 certainly the Wahhabi tradition has historically, from its emergence in the 19th century, advocated a, a far more simplistic interpretation and iconoclastic interpretation of Islam than we find in, in other contexts. OK, so um, here you can see a map. This map shows you. Uh, what Arabia looked like. So this is not the modern state of Saudi Arabia and Yemen. This, this is the uh, Arabia at the time of the Prophet Muhammad. And so one of the things that you have to be aware of is that uh, Mecca, you can see there, or Makkah, as it's, uh, as it's some uh, prefer to pronounce it, and, and Medina, the city of the Prophet. Now, now actually, you know, Muhammad was uh, from Mecca, but he had to migrate to Medina when his teaching uh, infuriated many of the people of Mecca, and he's, he lived in Medina for something like three decades before he finally, in, in about four or five years before his death, returned to Mecca triumphantly. And this is where uh, Islam then spread as a total religion throughout the Arabian Peninsula. But for many years of his life, he was he was locked. Muhammad was locked in a uh, in a conflict with the people of of uh, Mecca, which was a, which was a center of pilgrimage. That uh, you know his his uh, uh, view that there is no god but God and Muhammad is his prophet. That he was the prophet of God. That there was only one God, or this insistence on the oneness of God, what was was very threatening to many of the early people in Mecca because there they were uh, many polytheists there. People came, took pilgrimages to worship a wide variety of gods. And so if Muhammad were to triumph, then many people's livelihood and, and, and basic views on life would, would be very profoundly threatened. And so this conflict went on for a long time. And this forms the backdrop of many of these issues that Mirnissi is going to be exploring, as we'll see. But for now, just keep in mind that, 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 that these were not the same cities. Medina was where Prophet Muhammad lived for 30 some odd years. He was from Mecca originally, and then towards the end of his life, he will return triumphantly to Mecca, which again is the city that has the uh, altar built by Abraham and his son Ishmael, the, 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 the Kaaba, uh, uh, that uh, also the well of Zamzam, where Hagar and Ishmael found this well in the city 
flourished around in pilgrims today, both pray at the tomb, uh, excuse me, at the, uh, not at the tomb, but at the, uh, at the Kaaba laid by uh, Muhammad and uh, Ishmael, and also drink water from the well of Zamzam, discovered by uh, Hajar. Now, Mernissi is going to make a point that we, that's, that particularly for those of us uh, in the United States who are not that familiar with this world and the viewpoints of Muslims have to bear in mind, and that is that when she uses this expression, we Muslims, she's not necessarily referring to this in, in a, a religious sense, but let's, let's look at her, um, her definition. She's saying the expression, we Muslims, does not refer to Islam in terms of an individual choice or a personal option. I believe being Muslim as belonging to a theocratic state, what the individual thinks is secondary for this definition. Being Marxist or Maoist or atheist does not keep one from obeying the national laws, those of the theocratic state, which define the crimes and set the punishments. Being Muslim is a civil matter, a national identity, a passport, a family code of laws, a code of public rights. So one should not confuse Islam as a belief, a personal choice, and Islam as law, as state religion. Now this, this I think is, is particularly challenging, and I'm, it's important that she makes this observation early on, because in, in the West, for instance, in the United States, and uh, Western Washington University, where I teach, which is a liberal arts university, the United States, which is liberal in the sense that you have the separation of religion and state built into the uh, Constitution. Uh, there, there's an assumption of secularity or of division between religion and state that is not true in the Islamic world. And so it's important to note that that it's it, there's a sense in which it just doesn't matter uh, what you believe personally in a religious sense, you're still, it's still incumbent on you to, uh, to follow the laws of the, uh, of the theocratic state. And I'll give you one, I'll give you just a per, one personal anecdote that may help illustrate this is that I was living in Amman, Jordan, uh, a number of years ago, and it was Ramadan where one is supposed to fast. And I, you know, I totally forgot and I walked outside and I was eating an apple, just walking down the street eating an apple and people were giving me funny looks and I suddenly realized, oh yeah, I gotta, I thought, what am I doing? I'm not supposed to be doing that. And so what I'm saying is that it, does, it, it simply doesn't matter if you believe that one should fast or not. During Ramadan, you, you, know, you better uh, adhere to the, uh, to, to the norms. And, and so that's, that's the point that she's making. And so there are many people who are pious Muslims. There are some who are sometimes pious. Some people pay, pray five times a day. Some people don't pray at all. That's a secondary question from the question of Islam as a, um, as a theocratic state. So let's, let's bear that in mind. And that's the definition of what it means to be sort of we Muslims and that she's giving us in this text. So she says, beyond its spiritual dimension, Islam was first and foremost a promise of power, unity, and triumph for marginalized people, divided and occupied, who wasted their energy in intertribal wars. And she says, let us not forget that the word Islam means submission. This is a really important point. Um, and uh, again, it means salam, it means peace as well, but it means submission or peace uh, through submission. And so there is a real sense in which uh, it, it is, uh, the, the Islamic world is, is a world in which one must, um, let's say it's a total religion in a way that's that's not the same, let's say, of the influence of Christianity in the West. And so uh, even, you know, the invitation to return to, let's say, um, like, well, when, when George W. Bush uh, invaded uh, Iraq, or the United States invaded Iraq during the Bush administration, he I mean, many people, I was living again also in Jordan at that time, and many, many felt that uh, it was really more about promoting liberalism than what many people, many Muslims in Jordan and elsewhere felt that the U.S. invasion of Iraq was more about prom promoting liberalism, liberal capitalism, free market uh, economy than it was uh, about promoting uh, democracy. But from, from the Islamic perspective, uh, you know, this, you know, 
the, the era of religious pluralism, you know, what's called, you know, the Yahiliaya, you know, the, or the, the era of ignorance, the time, you know, before the time of the Prophet Muhammad or the time of Islam was an era of tribal warfare. It was, was an era of, um, was an era of, of violence and suffering. And so Islam, one of the things that Islam did was it brought an end to that. And so the, the sort of the invitation to return to an era of religious pluralism is something that is not necessarily greeted with much enthusiasm in this context. And so I think that's something that we, we need to bear in mind as we look at this material is, again, this, as Marissi underscores, Islam means submission, that there's one God, Muhammad is his prophet, and this is this is the beginning place of how the uh, Islamic society is organized, this agreement on this point. Now, uh, nonetheless, uh, the interpretation of the Quran is extraor can be extraordinarily complex, and the interpretation of Hadith can be extraordinarily complex, what I'm calling here Quranic uh, hermeneutics, uh, and hermeneutics means, in effect, uh, you know, it's the art of reading or the science of reading, uh, the science of reading or the art of reading the Quran. It's 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 not uh, a simple thing, and you can, as we're going to see, Mernissi is a, a very skilled uh, hermeneutic reader or a exegete of Quran and of Hadith, and the text, her text. Uh, starts out with a hadith, and a hadith is means a saying of the Prophet Muhammad. It's one of the sayings that are attributed to the Prophet Muhammad, and she tells us this little anecdote about how she goes into a grocery store, and a, uh, a, a school teacher says to her, those who entrust their affairs to a woman will never know prosperity. And this is a reputedly a hadith or saying of the Prophet Muhammad, and this silences her and it also frustrates her and so this really is the beginning point for her or the beginning of her inquiry and so she she begins to look more into the question and she comes to the conclusion that the te that the school teacher in the grocery store was right she says that the hadith uh, was it was you know it was from uh, al bukhari's uh, you know collections of hadiths which we're going to talk about in just a minute and, and it was one of those hadith that al-Bukhari classified as authentic after rigorous uh, process of selection, verification, and counter-verifications. And then she, Mernissi, comments, she says, this hadith, that those who trust their affairs to a woman will never know prosperity, she says, becomes the sledgehammer argument used by those who want to exclude women from politics. And then she goes further and says that this hadith is so important that it's practically impossible to discuss the question of women's rights in Islam without referring to it, debating it, and taking a position on it. So this is her launching point into this inquiry, into the question of women's rights in Islam. So she says, okay, if Muhammad really said this, let's let's think it through. Okay. And this is where this is where everything starts first. So Let's let's begin though by uh, again. I'm, I have to assume that my uh, listeners here are not particularly familiar with these issues, and so just to quickly review, we can say that in the Islamic tradition, one distinguishes between the the book in the seventh heaven or the seventh or, or the, the the heavenly book. Uh, all of the uh, Abrahamic traditions are construed in Islam as religions of the book, and the Quran itself. Now the word Quran means oral recitation and that that means it's that it has to be spoken in effect it's not the quran unless it's spoken and it's spoken in arabic and uh this is different from say the mushaf or the written uh version of the text um and uh the quran is said to be a representation or a copy of the heavenly book now it's important to note however and and i think this is important for particularly for people in the West, uh, my students at Western Washington University to understand is that in Islam, that the Torah and the Gospels, the Torah being uh, revealed in Hebrew and the Gospels in Greek are also said to be authentic revelations. This is why Jews and Christians are considered also to be peoples of the book, but Muslims generally believe that both the Torah and the Gospels were not preserved uh, 
uh, were not carefully preserved in the way that, and sometimes, you know, changes were made as the belief as opposed to the Quran, which is inerrant and perfectly preserved. So uh, the, the Quran then, it's, it's a source of great pride then that, uh, that Muhammad received a, a revelation in the Arabic language itself. So, but, so we want to then distinguish between, um, between uh, the heavenly uh, word or the word of God, the Quran, which is a copy of the word of God and the Hadith, which is uh, the word of man. Okay, so let's, let's work on this distinction for just a minute. Here's what she says. She says, for, and this was the miracle, God spoke to Muhammad in his native tongue, Arabic. This is an important point to remember. Only Jews and Christians had had this honor and privilege of direct revelation from God in their native languages. The case of Judaism, the, the Torah and having been revealed in Hebraic, in the case of the Christian tradition, the Gospels having been revealed in Greek. Again, legitimate revelations, just like the Quran although uh, tampered with and so not as reliable. Muhammad would receive his final revelation nine days before his death, June 8th in the year 632, according to the, the Common Era. The Prophet received Allah's message orally and transmitted it orally. The order of the revelations correspond to the needs of the moment. The surahs revealed at Mecca set forth dogma and the duties of the Prophet. The surahs revealed later at Medina related to, the, to problems that the prophet faced and to questions asked of him by the first Muslims. Okay, so just again to, to very quickly review. So Muhammad himself, the prophet Muhammad did not, uh, was not literate. He received oral recitations, oral revelations on a number of occasions. And so uh, th there is a belief that he received the Quran all at once and then uh, he, he received each surah or each revelation in a particular context and setting. And so in interpreting the surahs, it's important to also understand the context. And I think this is why if you're not familiar with this tradition and you're looking at it, it can be very puzzling to read the Quran because you don't know the historical context. Whereas, you know, most Muslims say in the uh, in Africa and the Middle East are, are much more familiar with the context within which each individual surah was revealed to, to uh, Muhammad. So this is one of the reasons, again, why it's important to read a text like Mernissi's The Veil and the Malik, because she provides that context so that if you don't know that context, so you can understand it. And so she distinguishes then in the early days of Mecca, uh, Prophet Muhammad received many revelations that were about the Islamic religion, particularly in the duties of a Muslim. And then later when he became in Medina, when he was expelled from Mecca and became the leader of the religious community in Medina, um, he had to deal with problems of governance. And so the, the later revelations tend to be longer and they tend to be more focused on very particular uh, historical, political, you know, situations that that the Muslim community confronted. And this is, as we're going to see, this is going to be true of the surahs and, and the uh, about linked to questions of, of the hijab or the veil. They're going to be linked to this later period in Medina when particular crises and problems arose that surahs came to uh, address. Okay, but now, as we said, we want to make a very clear distinction because when when the Quran is revealed to the Prophet Muhammad, it is not the Prophet Muhammad himself who is speaking. He is merely a, a vehicle or a mouthpiece through whom God speaks. That's very different, however, from the Hadith. These are the sayings of the Prophet Muhammad. And so we want to distinguish between the words of God and the words of, of, a, of a mere man or a human being. Now, now Muhammad, uh, you know, is, is not like uh, Jesus in the Christian tradition. He's not a God man. He's not an incarnation of the divine. He's merely a man, but he's also a very respected man, a very highly venerated man. And so uh, it's not just the words, the Hadith are not just the words of anyone. They're the words of a very particular man, the best of all men, Prophet Muhammad, 
but not uh, uh, an incarnation of the divine. It's just, it's important just, you know, to be aware that in, in the Christian tradition, the Messiah, you know, Jesus is the Messiah in the Islamic tradition, but Messianism in Islam does not uh, imply incarnation. In the Christian tradition, Messianism tends to imply incarnation. The word Christ is a Greek, you know, uh, translation of the word Messiah, but it also means Christ as the revealed uh, word of God as the incarnate of, of the divine. The, the Quran is very clear. Muhammad was very clear in the Hadith that this is something that Islam rejects. Jesus was is considered to be a prophet in Islam, but not an incarnation of the divine. And so we shouldn't think that Muhammad either is an incarnation of the divine and that his words are not uh, the same as the words of God. So, but they're but they're important words. So if we think of Sharia law, then we can think of, you know, uh, there, there's a hierarchy that, that is established between, you know, if, if you want to figure out, you know, how, how one should live one's life, you first look to the Quran. If you can't find in the Quran uh, anything that speaks to a particular situation or question, then one can go to the Hadith, which is, again, the word of man or the word of the Prophet Muhammad. If you can't find anything there, there's reasoning by analogy. And then if, if uh, that fails, there's, uh, there's consensus, but this is not just the, con like sense of the consensus in the sense of uh, mass vote, but the consensus of those who are steeped in, uh, in Quranic hermeneutics or in, the, the, in explicating, doing the exegetical work of interpreting the Quran and the Hadith. So uh, let's, let's then, as, as we think about this distinction, let's again remember the situation where she goes into the grocery store and she's rebuked and she's, but she's not rebuked with the surah from the Quran. She's rebuked with the Hadith. And so this is really, she says, okay, well, let's, let's look at this Hadith. And one question she's going to ask is how trustworthy is it? And as we're going to see, she's going to find this is not a trustworthy Hadith and that she has every right as a Muslim to make this inquiry, even if the so-called male elite doesn't like her doing so or doesn't like the conclusions that she comes to as she challenges this hadith, which she's going to find very problematic, as we'll see. Now, uh, al-Bukhari, Muhammad al-Bukhari is a really important figure uh, to, to know about. He was a Persian Muslim. He lived from 810 to 870. Uh, I, excuse me, that's a mistake there. I wrote BCE. It's actually common era, not BCE. He lived uh, about, you know, you know, about 200 years or so after the time of, of the prophet Muhammad. Now, Solomon, who, who transcribed the Quran, was also a Persian. Again, as I said, prophet Muhammad was not literate. Uh, but al-Bukhari then, what he did was um, after the, uh, you know, in the early days of the period after the death of the Prophet Muhammad, he went around gathering various sayings of the Prophet, Moda uh, Prophet Muhammad. These were hadith. So there were many things, there were many who reputed sayings to the Prophet Muhammad. But the question that al Bukhari confronted was how can we know which of these sayings are reliable? And so he went, you know, everywhere in, in the Islamic world at this time. Where, of people who were reputed to be connected to Prophet Muhammad and the family of the Prophet Muhammad. And he gathered up the various sayings that he, uh, that he heard. He tabulated them and he subjected them to a very rigorous analysis to authenticate which hadith were legitimate and which hadith were not. And so al-Bukhari gathered about 200 million hadith. He reduced that number to about 600,000 and then he, uh, out of that 600,000 that he subjected to very careful analysis, he, leg he, he legitimated about 7,257 that he considered to be authentic sayings of the Prophet Muhammad. Now, uh, some of the criteria uh, were questions, for instance, of linear time, linear history. Uh, could it, you know, did it make sense if somebody reputed to have heard something that Muhammad said that was not chronologically accurate, you could discount that particular hadith. Geography, if he, if he was said to have said it in the wrong place. He looked at oral histories, biographies, genealogies, questions of linguistics, the way that it was uttered. 
And then isnads, these were lines of transmission. Who were the ones who reputed, were reputed to have heard the Prophet Muhammad uh, uh, utter this hadith? Uh, this is one of the things that uh, Mernissi is going to zero in on is, is the lines of transmission that she's going to find to be questionable. And one of the questions she's going to ask is, that are the people who heard Muhammad make this utterance, were they reliable? Were the, were the witnesses reliable witnesses? And it's perfectly legitimate. As a Muslim, it's perfectly legitimate for her to ask this question. And here's what she says. She says, the great lesson to be drawn from al Bukhari's experience in coming to grips with the flight of time and failing memory is that one must be true to one's method and honor it. And certainly al Bukhari was, he was very rigorous in his methodology. By continuing to mistrust all those who regulate their affairs with the help of Hadith. If at the time of al Bukhari there were already 596,752 false Hadith in circulation, it is easy to imagine how many there are today. The most astonishing thing is that the skepticism that guided the work of the founders of religious scholarship has disappeared today. There were many liars who tried to put into the mouth of the prophet's words that would benefit them. And so, yeah, this is a wonderful point that she makes is that the Hadith, while valuable, they need to be approached with the spirit of skepticism. One shouldn't just accept a hadith because one likes the sound of it. One should really, it's, it's incumbent on one to make a, an investigation into the legitimacy of that hadith. If, if the hadith can be found to truly be attributed to the Prophet Muhammad, that's one thing. But if the hadith is, is a bogus hadith, a false hadith, then it's, it's right that it should be rejected. This is the point that she's making. And she also, it's interesting, she says, well, you know, Bukhari found that there were so many liars out there that he that he began to divide them into very particular categories. Now we we live in a world where uh, you know lying for for instance for many politicians it's a uh, lying is about as natural as a drinking water and breathing air and and this was not much different in the days of Al Bukhari and so he said that you know in the first category of liars he said there were those who attribute to the prophet remarks that he did not make. In this category, Al Bukhari divided into two subgroups, those who lie for material advantage and those who lie for ideological advantage. Now, the second one's going to be particularly important for understanding her uh, criticism of the hadith that she heard uttered in the grocery store, uh, this, this category of those who lie for ideological advantage. Uh, certainly, we know politicians very often lie for ideological advantage, and this was no different in, in the time that al-Bukhari was alive. And then number two, those who did not fabricate the content of the hadith itself, but simply falsified the chain of transmitters, the isnads. So uh, some people made up lies about, not about the hadith, but about who was reputed to have heard the hadith, the witnesses. And then three, I find this one particularly interesting, those who simply lie. There are just those who lie because they, they lie. And uh, the, the, that's a, an interesting human uh, psychological uh, uh, fact to, to reflect upon, I think. There's a lot of, a lot of uh, insight into that one. Now, the context of this hadith that she hears is in the grocery store is the battle of the camel which took place on november 7 656 common era this was a very important event in the history of islam this inaugurates the schism that takes place between sunni and shiite it's interesting to note that aisha the uh, the favorite wife of the prophet muhammad led the forces of what become known as the Sunni into battle against Ali and uh, the partisans of Ali who come to be known as the Shiite. And this is a, this is a disaster uh, for Aisha and her followers. There are many, many who are killed that day. And so when uh, uh, Abu Bakra, who is said to have uttered, who heard the Prophet Muhammad utter this, those, 
uh, who entrust their affairs to a woman will never know prosperity. The context of this is that, you know, it's, it's a very difficult moment politically for uh, Muhammad's wife, Aisha. Now, now uh, who, who was the leader of, of the warriors or the, the, the soldiers against um, uh, Ali and his followers. Now, one might note, it's quite interesting that Aisha was at the head of this entire army. So here you had the, the, the main general of the army uh, was a woman, but, but she was defeated in battle. And so this uh, hadith was said to have been uttered at this moment of her defeat. But it was a very convenient memory for, for Abu Bakr to have. And this is a point that uh, Mernissi is going to make. Now, the picture on the right is of Ali. I should note this is from the Shiite tradition. Many, if you're Sunni Muslim, particularly if you're Wahhabi, the Sunni Wahhabi tradition tends to be very iconoclastic. And so many in, in this, 80% uh, uh, of Muslims, I should note, are Sunni, only about 20% or so are Shiite. So, so the vast majority of Muslims in the world would find this image of, of Ali to be very problematic because uh, Islam, particularly Sunni Islam, has a much more, a much stricter interpretation of the second commandment of the Mosaic law, which is the ban on graven images, than the Christian tradition. The Christian tradition, the second commandment, the ban on graven images is dropped. Uh, and then the 10th commandment, thou shall not marry, thou shall not covet thy neighbor's wife, or thou shall not covet thy neighbor's property or house, is bifurcated into two. And so you still have 10 commandments in the Christian tradition, but the second commandment of the ban on graven images is dropped. Now, the reason for this is because in the Christian tradition, it said that Jesus is God. Jesus represented himself to us as such. And so therefore, it's licit to create representations of him. But since in Islam, Jesus is not God, this is also true of Judaism, of course, um, it's it, the second commandment remains as valid as ever. So for, for many Muslims to create images in the way that we see here of Ali would be very problematic. But this is not the case in the Shiite tradition. And this is, again, one of the reasons for one of the many reasons for tensions between the Shiite and Sunni tradition. On, on the uh, right, you see a picture of Aisha. Uh, but here, even so, you can see that her face is remains totally veiled, as does the face of the Prophet Muhammad. It's very uh uh, it's very disrespectful and sacrilegious to create representations of Prophet Muhammad. This is, again, one of the reasons why uh, there's so many conflicts that take place when, when uh, you know, Europeans, like, say, in France, will do cartoons of Muhammad. It's very offensive from the Islamic perspective. Um, but these were the two figures, in any case, who um, were uh, in this battle. Ali then becomes the who was the nephew of, of the Prophet Muhammad, who married Fatima, his uh, oldest daughter, and had two children, Hassan and Hussein, that come from this lineage. And then Aisha, who was the uh, the daughter of uh, Abu Bakr, not to be confused with Abu Bakr, uh, who becomes the first caliph, Ali becomes the fourth caliph, or leader of the Islamic community. But in, in this setting, uh, Aisha's been dealt a very devastating blow, and this is when suddenly... Um, this Ab Abu Bakr, not Abu Bakr, but Abu Bakr is said to have heard this, the prophet say, those who entrust their affairs to women will never know prosperity. Now, here's what Mernissi says. She says, since this hadith is included among those thousands of authentic hadith accepted by the meticulous al-Bukhari, it is a priori considered true and therefore unassailable without proof to the contrary since we are here in scientific terrain. And so therefore, if this is the case, she says, nothing bans me as a Muslim woman for making a double investigation, historical and methodological of this hadith and its author, and especially of the conditions in which it was first put to use. Who uttered this hadith? Where, when, and why, and to whom? Okay, so she, now she's uh, she says, well, okay, if Al Bukhari found it to be legitimate, let's let's uh, roll up our sleeves and get to work. And so she's going to dig even deeper into the question and and exhibit perhaps even more skepticism than the meticulous uh, Al Bukhari about this uh, hadith. Now Abu Bakr, you can look him up. He, this is also he's known as the man of the pulley. This is a 
the designation that this is, I'm taking this particular, not from her book, but from the Encyclopedia of Islam, which is published by Brill. Um, he is a, he was a former slave. And uh, there was this, when Muhammad led a siege of the town where he lived, he let himself down by a pulley. This is how he became known as the man of the pulley. And so therefore, uh, and he helped uh, the, the Muslims. And so Muhammad gave him his freedom. Uh, but, uh, and, he, and he, he lived and died in Basra. But uh, the, this uh, encyclopedia notes, and this is a point that Mernissi is going to make, that he was whipped by Umar, who was also one of the early caliphs of Islam and a companion of the prophet Muhammad because he was found to be uh, known as a liar for after having accused someone for uh, of having committing adultery. Now in Islam, it's, it's very, uh, one needs to be very careful about leveling accusations of adultery. It's a very serious matter. And so uh, those who make accusations and, and are not found to be proven correct or, or, or found not to have been honest in making such accusations are subject to very harsh punishment. In the case of uh, Abu Bakr, Umar had him whipped because he was known to, because he made this false accusation. And so this is a very important point that Mernissi is making because she's, she's proving that Abu Bakr is, is a known liar. He was known to lie. He was, and he was publicly punished for having lied. And so she's establishing that the man who, who, who claimed that he heard this utterance was a known liar, All right? And so she concludes then, she says, Abu Bakr must be rejected as a source of hadith by every good, well-informed Malachite Muslim. I won't go into the Malachite there, but you can, you can look this up. This is a, this is a school of, uh, that, that has a particular interpretation of Islam among three other prominent schools. And so she says, well, uh, she, she basically what she's saying is that, you know, that, that he fits into what Al Bukhari called, you know, category one or the liar, category one B, which we looked at earlier, the liar for ideological gain. So he would be a liar for I ideological gain. And she says, a Abu Bakr must have had a fabulous memory because he recalled the words of the prophet a quarter of a century, so 25 years after the death of the prophet, at the time that the Caliph Ali retook Basra, having defeated Aisha at the Battle of, of the Camel. So it was a very convenient hadith for him to remember, this, this man who already was, uh, who lived in Basra in disgrace because he was a known liar, and he remembered it just at a, as a very uh, providential moment. So he had, a, as, as uh, Mernissi points out, he had a truly astonishing memory for political opportune hadith, which curiously and most effectively fitted into the stream of history. And so he, he, he was an opportunist, in effect, a political opportunist. And she uh, makes, as, as did the encyclopedia I just cited, she also makes note that he was publicly flogged in his lifetime for committing slander. All right, um, so I want to now take a moment and look at, there, there are many other cases that she brings up in her text. We don't have time to review them all here, but I want to focus in on the case of sodomy in particular. And I, I want to do this, not, I mean, the case of sodomy is an interesting question, and, the, and her discussion of it I think is very interesting, but our for our purposes, um, we want to think about this in, 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 in differentiating between the explication uh, or, or the challenging uh, of, of this hadith that we've just seen, her explication of it, her questioning of it, and that of the Quran. And so if we, if we keep in mind this distinction that the Quran is the word of God and the hadith is the word of man, which is reputed to have been uh, passed down through the witnesses who heard Muhammad say these words, uh, the, the, the hadith, my, the point that I want to make here is the hadith can be subjected to scrutiny in a way that's not, or, you know, or skeptical criticism, you know, in a way that's not necessarily the case when it comes to the Quran. Now, it's not to say one doesn't exercise rigorous um, hermeneutic principles in interpreting the Quran, but one keeps in mind the distinction that the Quran is the word of God, the hadith is the word of man as transmitted through you know, witnesses. So one cannot question in that sense the, uh, 
the the truth of the Quran. So I want to I want to let me let me put it this way because many of my many of you who are listening are coming from a, a Christian tradition. So we can say, for instance, if we want to reduce the Christian tradition to one principle, if you say, well, what what does Christianity really treat teach? Well, well the, the essence of the Christian tradition is that Jesus is God. Now, again, this is why Christianity and Islam, although religions of the book or Abrahamic traditions are different religions because Muslims don't believe that Jesus is God. And so in the Christian tradition, if you were to say, well, I think Jesus was a good man, like Thomas Jefferson says, he was a good man, he was a good teacher, he had many moral lessons for us. One can say that, but but in saying that, in, in, if, if one goes further and says, even though he was a good teacher, he wasn't God. Well, that put that places one outside of the Christian tradition. Now, in the case of Islam, if one says, the Quran is an interesting book. It has nice moral lessons, but it's not the word of God. Well, if one says that, then then one is outside of the religious tradition and so uh, of Islam. And so the essence really of Islam is that the Quran is the revealed word of God, much as the essence of Christianity is, is that Jesus is, is the son of God. And so there, that, that's an important point to, to bear in mind. And so the, the hermeneutic challenge that Mernissi confronts as she surveys these issues is that you know she she has as a muslim woman she's going to approach the quran with a certain amount of veneration and respect much like let's say a christian woman or a feminist christian might you know look at the figure of jesus with a certain amount of veneration and respect so she can she's not going to challenge the quran in quite the same way that she'll challenge the hadith and this is this you can bear this in mind as you're going through some of the issues that she looks at in, in the text. So we're just going to focus on one here to get clarity on this. And this is the case of sodomy. So what, what does sodomy mean? This is something we want to, you know, think about. Um, here's what she says. Uh, she says, you know, the people, this would be the people in the area around the area of Mecca had sexual intercourse with their wives uh, from in front and from behind. She quote, uh, quote unquote, and the latter position was unknown in Medina. So in the Mecca area, uh, you know, people had sexual intercourse from in front and from behind. In Medina, having sex from behind was not known. And so an Ansari woman went to see Umm Salama. This was one of the wives of the Prophet Muhammad and asked her to put the question to the Prophet. As was his custom, the Prophet summoned the person concerned in order to communicate the response revealed by heaven. Okay, and that, that note, this is Bernice's language, that, that the response that the prophet gives to the inquiry, it's not the prophet speaking, but it's a response that is revealed by heaven. And Bernice is saying this as a believing Muslim. We need to bear that in mind. When the woman came, the prophet, or she calls the prophet, arbitrator, legislator, uh, in this context, recited verse 233, of Surah 2, which gives to men the right of decision regarding sexual positions. And here's the Surah, you women are a tilth for you, or a field, a tilth for you to, your women are a field or tilth for you to cu cultivate, so go to your tilth or field as you will. All right, so this is a really interesting case because I think uh, this can help us uh, understand also like differences, let's say, in orientations to questions of sexuality in the Islamic world and in the uh, Christian West. Okay, I want to give you by just to get some insight in this, I want to con con contrast this with uh, with something that was written by St. Augustine of Hippo. Uh, one of the most important uh, figures in the Christian tradition who wrote of Christian doctrine, confession, city of God, and other works. He lived from 354 to 430, or about 200 years before the time of the prophet Muhammad, 300 years after the time of, of Jesus. And here's what he says in his book of Christian doctrine on this question, on the same question that's being raised here of sodomy. He says, Augustine says, for if one man according to the custom of his time, could be chased with many wives. He's thinking of the time of, of the Old Testament prophets, the prophets of the Torah. Another man today can be lustful with a single wife. And Augustine says, I approve the man who exploits the fertility of many women for a purpose other than sexual gratification, more highly than one who enjoys one woman's flesh for its own sake. 
In God's eyes, the men to whom the Apostle Paul allowed sexual intercourse with their individual wives because of their lack of self-control are at a lower stage than those who each had several wives but look to the procreation of children in the sexual act. Okay, so what, what is he saying here? Well, um, a few years ago, I think it was one, it was a previous pope came out with this statement that, that had a lot of, got a lot of attention in the Western media. And he said uh, that, that Christian men, Catholic men have to be careful about lusting after their own wives and people who are not in the Catholic Christian tradition. So how, how can you lust after your own wife? If you're married to your own wife, you know, then, then um, that seems, seems kind of a strange thing to say, but he, the, what the Pope was saying, I think it was John Paul II, it was saying was, was something very similar to what Augustine was saying. What Augustine is saying here is that, to simplify this, is that polygamy, he finds polygamy, if it's, uh, like it's say in the case of the Old Testament, if it's conducted for the sake of procreation, that, that that's preferable for a man to have many wives and, and in each case have sexual relations with each wife for the purposes of procreation than for a man to have just one wife but have sex with that one wife without having any procreative intent. This becomes known in the Christian tradition as onanism. You might look up the figure of Onan who spills his seed on the floor of his tent with his wife uh, Tamar because he doesn't want her to get pregnant because it's his brother's wife and then he's he's killed for this offense or god god strikes him dead um and so um the point is then is that that what augustine is saying is something very different from what this sura says the sura says your women are a field for you to cultivate go forth and plow the field as you will um, that's that's very different because what Augustine is saying, I mean, in effect, the, the, the Quran is more open, let's say, to sexuality, uh, sexuality for purposes of, that are not necessarily procreative, they're for purposes of pleasure alone, whereas Augustine is, is saying sexuality really should be for purposes of, uh, of, of, of procreation. And uh, again, remember in the Christian tradition, he quotes here the Apostle Paul. In the Christian tradition, uh, the Apostle Paul basically says, you know, people should only get married if they can't control themselves. So we could say in the, you know, in the Christian tradition, celibacy is the, uh, is the ideal. Monogamy is the concession to human nature. In the Islamic tradition, monogamy is the ideal. Polygamy is the concession to human nature, the idea that, that one should be celibate, it's, it's simply not, uh, it's, it's looked upon with great skepticism, let's say, from, from the Muslim uh, perspective. And so this surah tells us something about this. And so here, here's what Mernissi says about this surah. She says, what is certain is that with this verse, heaven supported the men. Uh, and and it, it, this was not the case, say, in the Augustinian view. It went, it went different from how, let's say, Augustine would have thought about this question. They had the right to use the positions that they wanted, even if some of them were not, you know, procreative. Women had no right to protest. They had only to submit to men's whims. In any case, this verse excluded women from the debate and by doing so transformed the question, which was reduced to the following, do men have the right to sodomize their wives? And so that's Mernissi's view, but I, I think I find that less compelling than what she says next, which is that what seems important to me, this is what Mernissi is saying, and I totally agree with her here, is that the debate in Islamic religions, uh, religious literature is never closed. Each generation takes it up where the previous one left it to discuss it again. So whether whatever trad religious tradition one is coming from, Christian, Islamic, Judaic, or whatever, uh, what, what, she's, what she's really drawing attention to here is the importance of hermeneutic, the, the, let's say the, the hermeneutic conversation that takes place throughout the generations uh, regarding the importance of the text. So, so the interpretation is not fixed once and for all. Each new generation, whichever Abrahamic tradition one belongs to, has to take up anew the same interpretive questions that previous generations have wrestled with. And this, this is what she's uh, insisting upon. Now, let's, I want to turn our attention now to this question very specifically of the veil or the hijab. And so we'll zero in 
on this question, which is at the heart of, of this particular text. And so one of the things that she's going to say, as we'll see, is that the question of the hijab is a it, it's a very complex question. It's a it's a very important theological concept, and she's she's very anxious that it not be reduced to some mere head covering that someone wears. There's a lot more here going on in this question, and and she's like like other Muslim women more recently, for instance, in the West have been, you know, somewhat critical of you know there are some Western women who have who are not Muslims who have taken on the hijab in particular context to uh, assert their solidarity with Muslim women who are discriminated against. But many Muslim women have not been particularly happy with this because it's, it's kind of a, uh, a superficial gesture that fails really to appreciate the complexity of the questions involved. And so um, it's it's so some Muslim many Muslim women have said, look, don't just put on the hijab, and if you don't understand what what it is that you're doing, it's important that you investigate what it means to wear a hijab, and and it's a very complex question, perhaps not so in the eyes of the male elite either, who want to simplify it, reduce it to a scrap of cloth worn over the head, but Mernissi is going to show us that that it has a lot of nuances, and it's important for us to understand what those nuances are. And here's what she's going to ask the question. She's going to say, is it possible that the hijab, the attempt to veil women that is claimed today to be so basic to Muslim identity, is nothing but the expression of the persistence of the pre-Islamic Ment mentality, the Yahiliya, which uh, mentality. This is I mentioned earlier about the era of ignorance, the pre-Islamic era that Islam was supposed to annihilate. Does the does the hijab really represent in the early? Uh, what does the hijab really represent in the early Muslim context? What does the word signify? What are its what are its logic and justification? When was it inaugurated? For whom and why? So this is as, as she gets deeper into the you know text. This is the question she's going to explore, and she does a wonderful job of going very deeply into this question, and and again articulating it in such a way to make it accessible to those of us who are not coming from an Islamic background. And she's going to identify three main dimensions to the hijab. First, the visual dimension, which means to hide something from sight. There's the spatial dimension, which means to separate, to mark a border, to establish a threshold. And then there's the ethical dimension, which the hijab belongs to the realm of the forbidden. Anything that separates and protects is a hijab. And she gives the example how the Quran tells us when the Virgin Mary in Islam does it from the virgin birth, gives birth to Jesus, Prophet Isa in the Islamic tradition. The Quran says that she retires to a far off place where she'll be protected and unseen. So it's, it's a, um, it, it's linked to this idea of what's forbidden uh, for others to see. So we'll, we'll come back to these three definitions, but let's keep these three dimensions in mind. This will show us something about the complexity of the issues involved. And she underscores the concept of the hijab or the veil as a key concept in Muslim civilization. Just as sin is in the Christian context, the doctrine of original sin, which is not in either the Islamic or the Judaic tradition, or credit in the American capitalist system. So again, if you, uh, it's a wonderful point that she's making. If you want to understand Christianity, you've got to understand the doctrine of original sin. Particularly, let's say, if you're Muslim and you're not familiar with that doctrine at all, or if you're, if you're a Christian, you're looking at Islamic civilization, you better understand the concept of the hijab. It's a fundamental concept. Reducing or assimilating this concept to a scrap of cloth that men have imposed on women to veil them when they go into the street is truly to impoverish this term, not to say to drain it of its meaning, especially when one, when no, one knows that the hijab, according to the Quranic verse and Al-Tabari's uh, explanation, descended from heaven to separate the space between two men. So there's a really important number of points that she's making there. Uh, one is that the, the Quran uh, tells us that the hijab descended not to separate man from woman, but to separate men from each other, uh, but also to know that it is something that descended from heaven. And as such, it's incumbent on Muslims to understand it in all of its complexity. 
All right. So she's going to then underscore that when, when one thinks of the Islamic period, the era of the Prophet Muhammad prior to the descent of the hijab, space was divided in very different ways. Or it was, there was a very different organization of social space. This is an important point that she's going to make. And with the descent of the hijab or the veil, space is going to come to be divided in very different ways. Okay, so she points out that the prophet's architecture created a space in which the distance between private life and public life was nullified where physical thresholds did not constitute obstacles. It was an architecture in which the living quarters opened easily onto the mosque and thus played a decisive role in the lives of women and their relationship to politics. She'll go even further than this to say the prophet constructed Aisha's apartment, his wife, his favorite wife, Aisha, and he opened a door in the wall of the mosque that faced Aisha's apartment. He used that door when he went to pray in the mosque. The mosque and Aisha's room were so close together that sometimes for the purification ritual, the prophet had Aisha wash his hair without his having to leave the mosque. The prophet had only to lean his head from the mosque to Aisha's doorstep, and then she washed his head while she was having her period. Well, this is a really interesting and important point, particularly when you consider that in many places in the, Islam, in, in the Islamic world today, women who are menstruating are not even allowed to go into mosques. And here she's telling us that, uh, that, that the Prophet Muhammad would, would lay his head on Aisha's lap inside the mosque and she would wash his hair while she was menstruating. Well, this is certainly an uh, interesting point to reflect upon when we think about some of these uh, prohibitions linked to views about blood purity, which this would imply uh, is something that the Prophet Muhammad himself you know, repudiated. But the main point here then, however, is that in, in the time before the descent of the hijab, there was not the separation of the private and the public that is going to emerge after the fall of the hijab. Everybody lived in full view. The Prophet Muhammad's house apartment was in the mosque itself. Uh, here is what Mernissi says. She says, this insistence by the Prophet Muhammad on not setting up boundaries between his private life and his public life, which allowed his wives to be directly involved in the affairs of the Islamic State, little by little turned against him. It was the breach through which during the years of crisis, the attacks against him would be launched. OK, so she underscores then that his intent was not to separate the two the private and the public, but that his enemies use, they, they would look at what was going on in his household and they would use it against him. Uh, they, would, they would use it as a way of attacking him. And then she says, look, the, the Muslim God is the only monotheistic God whose sacred place, the mosque, opens onto the bedroom. The only one to have chosen a prophet who does not keep silent about his concerns as a man, but who on the contrary voices his thoughts about sexuality and desire. And so this really is an important difference between let's say Christianity and Islam. Jesus is, is uh, said is, is depicted most often as a, as a sexless prophet, a sexless deity. In effect, this was not the case with uh, the prophet Muhammad. That, there is, that he was far more open about questions of sexuality. The Islamic tradition in general is views sexuality as, as something that is you know, natural and is chastity as affirmed in the Christian tradition as something that is, uh, that is unnatural, uh, essentially. But uh, this, this openness about sexuality was used, she's going to underscore, by the enemies of the Prophet Muhammad to attack him on political terms, particularly in, 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 in situations when the community, the Islamic community was, was in a weak place and when it was engaged in battles, let's say with the partisans of the polytheists in Mecca. Uh, and then as, as, as the fortunes of the community, as the Islamic community led by the Prophet Muhammad fell, his enemies would, would see this as a kind of a wedge to get an ideological advantage upon him. Now here's a kind of a model of what the, the, the first mosque of the Prophet Muhammad would have looked like, which would have also had his 
living quarters present within where people would have prayed as well. So you can see it's far more simpler than the mosques of, of today. Now, here's what Mernissi says. She says, the instituting of the hijab would have been unnecessary in a situation in which the sexes were already separated and women were excluded from public life. By its very advent, the hijab reveals to us a social reality contrary to that which it came to put in place. The descent of the hijab at Zainab's wedding festivities, this, is a, this event occurred during the uh, wedding of the Prophet Muhammad with Zainab, is only understandable if we remember the extraordinary freedom of the Prophet's wives in the public sphere. Muhammad's determination to live his relationship with women as a constant and privileged experience was used by his political enemies to attack him, to wound him, to humiliate him, and finally to make him give up his aims for equality of the sexes. His political opponents used his private life as a political weapon against him. So as she's looking back at this early period, she says, look, if you look at what was going on, you can see that he interacted, that his wives that he interacted with in an open way had a, had a very powerful role in the early Muslim community that, that was deeply affected by the descent of the hijab at this particular event. So she's going to be very interested in this surah and in what happened. And here, here is the surah itself. O ye who believe, enter not the dwellings of the prophet for a meal without waiting for the proper time, unless permission be granted you. But if ye are not, if you are invited, enter, and when your meal is ended, then disperse. Linger not for conversation. Lo, that would cause annoyance to the prophet, and he would be embarrassed to ask you to go. But God is not embarrassed of the truth. And when ye ask of them, the wives of the prophet, anything, ask it of them from behind a curtain, a hijab, that is pure for your hearts and for their hearts. So this is uh, verse 53, Surah 33, revealed in year five of the Hijra, or it would have been year 627, common era. So this, again, as I said earlier, if you're reading the Quran, you don't know the political context. It may just seem, you just can't make any sense of it, but she's developing this complex context for us. And she tells us, you know, there was, there was a wedding going on. There were these get, there were these male guests and the time the, the party was over, the dinner was over. It was time for everybody to go home. But these, but these men just kept hanging around, hanging around. They were, you know, most likely flirting with the wives of the Prophet Muhammad, and he tried to get them to leave. He was very polite about it. They still wouldn't leave, and it, it created this, this situation that um, uh, was, was very tense. And this was the context before the, the, uh, the, the descent of the hijab or before this surah was revealed to Muhammad. And so here's what Mernissi says. She says, the Prophet had just got married and was impatient to be alone with his new wife, his cousin Zainab. He was not able to get rid of a small group of tactless guests who remained lost in conversation. The veil was to be God's answer to a community with boorish manners whose lack of delicacy offended a, pro a prophet whose politeness bordered on timid uh, timidity. So the Prophet Muhammad and her depiction of him, he's very, he was very polite. He was almost uh, to the point of being timid. And, uh, you know, he kept waiting for these men to leave. They wouldn't leave. And the veil was the answer to the problem of, of people who are just boors who have no manners and no sense of decorum. At a certain moment, she tells us, the prophet sat in the mill. Zainab was seated in a corner of the room. She was a woman of great beauty. All the guests departed except for three who seemed oblivious of their surroundings. They were still there in the room chatting away. Annoyed, the prophet left the room. And he goes and visits Aisha, and he retraces his steps later and comes back again. And he, saw, he sees that they're still there. They haven't left. They're still chatting. He he was extremely polite and reserved, she said, and so he left quickly and returned again to Aisha's apartment. Uh, now, this is, uh, 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 excuse me, I, I was, this is uh, Anas uh, Ibn Malik who's recording this uh, incident. He says, I don't remember anymore whether it was I or someone else who went to tell him, 
that the three individuals had finally decided to leave. In any case, Prophet Muhammad came back to the nuptial chamber. He put one foot in the room and kept the other outside. It was in this position that he let fall a curtain between himself and me, and the verse of the hijab descended at that moment. So this, this is the context we need to bear in mind. Um, okay. Um, now here's Mernissi. She gives us further information. She says, Islam went through a time of severe military crisis. The incident that took place during the night of the prophet's wedding to Zainab must be re-situated in its context. This is what she's doing. An epic of doubts and military defeats uh, that undermined the morale of the inhabitants of Medina. The prophet was threatened by men who stated during his lifetime their desire to marry his wives after his death. In addition to the incident about the lack of politeness of the guests of the wedding, it seems that the hijab came to give order to a very confused and complex situation. The hijab was to be the solution to a whole web of conflicts and tensions. And so there is, I think she's making a really important point here because she's noting there was, you know, this wasn't just this arbitrary small incident in the context of this wedding party, that there was a broader social political situation that was taking place in the Islamic community. And, and it, uh, it was, it was causing, you know, real problems. And so the hijab was an answer, not only to the boorishness of these individual guests and this very idiosyncratic and particular situation, but to a greater social political context. Here's her note, a relatively minor incident provokes a response so fundamental as the splitting of Muslim space into two universes, the interior universe, the universe of the household, and the exterior universe, the universe of, the, of public space, the public and the private. It introduced a breach in space that can be understood to be a separation of the public or the private, or indeed the profane from the sacred, but which was to turn into a segregation of the sexes. The veil that descended from heaven was going to cover up women, separate them from men, from the prophet, and so from God. And so again, this is the point that she made earlier that the hijab descend to separate men from men, but, it, but uh, to separate the, the public from the private, the profane from the sacred, but it became uh, a segregation of, of the sexes, which was not the context of its original uh, descent. So again, let's just review again the three dimensions. I, I want us to return to this point and to, and to consider it carefully. Again, there's the visual dimension, which it means to hide something from sight, the spatial dimension to separate, to mark a border, to establish a threshold, and then the ethical dimension. It belongs to the realm of the forbidden. Okay, um, but it has, as Mernissi notes, it has many more complex meanings that are uh, that, that the non-Islamic world is often oblivious to. For instance, in Sufism, it has an esoteric meaning, a meaning that a person whose consciousness is determined by sensual or mental passion and who as a result does not perceive the divine light in his soul. In this usage, it is man who is covered by a veil and not God, the one who is one who is trapped in earthly reality, who's unable to experiment with elevated states of consciousness, is is uh, uh, is covered in a kind of a hijab. Uh, it can mean in the Quran, it can mean a veil that hides God from men. It can take on a very negative uh, significance as well. And and the, the polytheist in particular is considered to be blinded by a hijab. So, you know, it's said, for instance, that every uh, verse in the Quran, every surah has an esoteric and an exoteric meaning, and that the Quran itself is protected by a kind of a covering so that, or a hijab or a veil, so that unbelievers can't ascertain its meaning. And so, again, this, this point is important because it also uh, underscores for us the complexity of the very idea of the veil that again cannot be reduced to just a piece of cloth that someone wears on their head. It's a, it's a, it's a profoundly important theological uh, 
concept that one needs to understand to understand Islam itself as a religion. Now, the other context that, uh, uh, that, that she discusses is the situation of Muslim women in Medina itself when they're becoming attacked on the streets. And so this is simply linked to the question of sexual harassment itself in a more vicious sense, literally uh, walking the jostling streets of Medina when uh, what Mernissi is calling here, the hypocrites who were, were men who attacked women and when they on the streets or sexually harassed them, and when and when they were asked to justify their behavior, they said, "Well, they thought these Muslim women were slaves." And so this other hijab, this other you know surah then emerges to separate the uh, the Muslim women from the slave women, or to, or to differ, differentiate them so that Muslim women would not be uh, harassed in in the streets. Uh, Free women, Marinesi says, free women made themselves recognized in order not to be harassed. It was better for them to be recognized. Women veiled their faces and only allowed one eye to be visible. So when, when we think about this, the hijab, this other uh, context that she's describing here, she's giving us further context about the hijab. She's thinking of it in relation to questions of sexual harassment. Now, whether you live in the Islamic world or in the, in the West, we all know about sexual harassment. It's, it's an ongoing problem, that uh, a social problem, and uh, harassment goes on in many different contexts. And so when, when women went out into the streets of Medina, they were harassed. And so the veil then became used, became a way of differentiating Muslim women from non-Muslim women, or, or essentially from women who could be harassed or the slave, which were the slave women and the, non, and the Muslim women who, who could not be harassed. And so this for Mernissi was, was a, a tragedy in effect, because it left certain women vulnerable to harassment while protecting others from harassment by virtue of having the hijab. Here's the sir itself. Oh, prophet, tell thy wives and daughters and the women of the believers to draw their cloaks close around them when they go abroad, or let's say when they go out in the streets. That will be better that so they may be recognized and not annoyed. So the hijab then becomes an answer to the problem of sexual harassment, but uh, Mernissi is going to note that this uh, leaves certain other women vulnerable, and so it's not an ideal uh, solution. In fact, it's, it remains a problem. The veil represents the triumph of the hypocrites, Mernissi observes. Slaves would continue to be harassed and attacked in the streets. The female Muslim population would henceforth be divided by a hijab into two categories, free women against whom violence is forbidden, and women slaves. The hijab reintroduced the idea that the street was under the control of those who did not restrain their desires and who needed a tribal chieftain to keep them under, under control. And so if we think again about the, the basic situation that is ongoing in many Muslim cities, and all you got to do is walk down the streets of Manhattan and New York, and you see the same kinds of things that, that, that women in the Islamic world, women in the Western world alike confront. This is the problem of sexual harassment. And so the hijab becomes a solution, but uh, from Mernissi's perspective, one that remains problematic because it leaves uh, women who without the hijab vulnerable to ongoing uh, sexual harassment and, and attack as they walk the streets seeking just to go about their business, but not being able to because of men who are not able to restrain themselves and act without decorum and without tact. Mernissi states, for Muslim women, security would never return to the city. No more than dreams can a journey back in time change the fact that the Medina of women would be forever frozen in its violent posture. From then on, women would have to walk the streets of uncaring, unsafe cities, ever watchful, wrapped in their jilb and their jilbab. The veil, which was intended to protect them from violence in the street, would accompany them for centuries, whatever the security situation of the city. For them, peace would never return. Muslim women were to display their hijab everywhere, the vestige of a civil war that, that would never come to an end. And this for Mernissi is, is a, uh, 
a tragedy. I mean, what would be more ideal is that women could be able to walk the streets without having to be uh, sexually harassed at all, without the need for the hijab to provide this kind of protection. But she, she makes the point that some Muslim women did try to resist. Some rejected wearing the hijab. They claim the right to go out a uh, barza, which means unveiled. A barza woman is one who does not hide her face and does not lower her head. It's a woman who is seen by people and receives visitors at home. A barza is a woman who has sound judgment, someone who is known for their reasoning. And we can't doubt that this is what uh, Mernissi is uh, recommending or, or how she sees herself as well as, as a barza, a woman who does not have to wear the hijab, does not lower her head, does not hide her face, who can be seen by people and is known as a woman of sound judgment and a woman of, you know, best known for her ability to reason. Now, she gives examples in the early Islamic period of such women, and one of them is, is uh, Sukhaniya, who was a uh, one of the daughters of, uh, of Ali, and she was celebrated for her beauty, for what, uh, as, as uh, Mernissi tells us, for what Arabs call beauty, an explosive mixture of physical attractiveness, critical intelligence, caustic wit. The most powerful men debated her, Mernissi says, and she ended up marrying five, some say six husbands. She crueled with some of them, made passionate declaration of love to others. In her marriage contract, she stipulated that she would not obey her husband, but would do as she pleased, and that she did not acknowledge that her husband had the right to polygamy. All this was the result of her interest in political affairs and poetry. Now, Mernissi does know that she herself, when uh, this, and this, by the way, this is the tomb uh, uh, where she's buried, this figure that Mernissi is invoking. Um, she, she describes a situation, Mernissi, where she's at a conference and she uh, evokes this figure and she infuriates one of the male uh, auditors at this conference who, who challenges her and calls her a liar in effect. But again, Mernissi is steeped in this history and she knows very well that she was not lying, that there was such a woman. This woman did not wear a veil and she is a powerful figure that one can look to uh, for inspiration as one can also look to other powerful women in the er early days of Islam like Aisha, like uh, Um Salama, who are also figures that she sees as being brilliant uh, women who, uh, you know, were, were, were certainly not uh, cowed and, and submissive. Um, this is uh, that the, 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 this woman was the granddaughter of Fatima. And she, um, you know, she was I'm, she, she lived from 671 to 737 and she did not uh, you know, she demanded that her husband be monogamous and she didn't go around with the veil and she essentially got what she wanted. And so Mernissi asked the question, it says, it remains to be asked, the memory of Um Salama, Ayesha and, and Suganya awakens no response and seems strangely distant and unreal. The answer without doubt is to be found in the time mirror wherein the Muslim looks at himself to foresee his future. The image of his woman will change when he feels the pressure, the pressing need to root his future in a liberating memory. Perhaps the woman should help the Muslim man do this through daily pressure for equality, thereby bringing him into a fabulous present. And so she sees she sees uh, Sukh Anya as as um, as well as Um uh, Salama and Aisha as being this this inspirational figure that one can look to as a way of helping to achieve the kinds of uh, uh, equality for women that she would like to see happen. She and here here's a, a saying of Aisha. She says, "I have not seen any woman suffering." as much as the believing woman and women. And this is something that, um, that uh, Renissi is seeking to address. And on the right there is uh, the uh, name of Um Salama. There's Renissi. You can see uh, she was a, uh, a, a wonderful uh, figure, a very inspiring intellectual. And I do recommend her books. You know, again, as I said, not every uh, Muslim reader is, is in the Islamic world is uh, 
agrees with her interpretation, the interpretation of some of the issues that I've laid out here. Uh, but uh, all I think have, would agree that she's a provocative figure and one who brings forth a new perspective to these issues. And as I said earlier, also one who, if you're a Western reader and you're coming to these ideas for the first time, she's, she's a great resource to go to. And so I, I hope that you enjoy reading her works as much as I have over the years.